you all for joining us. We're going to be talking about Norman McQueen's A River Runs Through It, which has become quite the fly fishing classic and definitely opened the sport to millions and millions of people. And I've never done this before. <laughs> so I wrote down some questions. I'm Charlie Levine. I'm the editor of Angler's Journal Magazine. And joining us is also Bill Sisson, who is the founding editor and um, Henry Hughes, one of our contributors, who's also a professor, and Gabriella McGrath, who works with us on and helps our social media. And um, so this is just going to be very informal. I encourage everyone to chime in if there's a question you want to ask, or if there's a thought you'd like to share, or a passage from the book. There's so many quotable quotes, <laughs> I guess, in here. Um his writing is just so beautiful and, and poignant and um, yeah. So I guess if everyone's cool, we'll just start. Okay. Let's start. Let's start. So a little background, the book was published in 1976 when Norman was 74 years old, which is pretty amazing to me that he waited so long to write it. He was a professor Um and it is very much semi-autobiographical he you know his brother was murdered he did grow up in montana and of course there was a movie that came out and that came out in 1992 which was actually just a couple of years after mclean died and if you read the book and watch the movie there's a lot of similarities there's a lot of differences too um but I guess I, I I wrote down some questions to just sort of get the conversation going. So I'm just going to throw out a question. Uh, the first question I wrote down was, well, actually, I'm going to read the first lines because they're so good. Okay, so the first paragraph of the book starts, in our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. We, leave, we lived at the junction of a great trout rivers in western Montana, and our father was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman who tied his own flies and taught others. He told us about Christ's disciples being fishermen, and we were left to assume, as my brother and I did, that all first-class fishermen on the Sea of Galilee were fly fishermen, and that John, the favorite, was a dry fly fisherman. And thus we begin. <laughs> So I don't know. What do you think, Bill? As far as opening paragraphs go, yeah, I think I, it's I, I think it's the best opening paragraph in fishing literature. It's but it's really it's, wonderful. Yeah, it is. To me, it always you know, you could almost you can't stop right there, but <clears throat> it said an awful lot. It set things up really nicely, and uh, I thought it was a wonderful beginning. Yeah. I see our friend Peter Kaminsky just joined us as well. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm doing good, guys. How are you? I'm good. Hello, Thanks Peter. for making the time. We were just getting started. I just read the first opening paragraph of the book. And um, so, yes. Yeah, that, and that's one of the great opening paragraphs of any book, I think. Oh, yeah. it's so gripping. And, you know, it gets right into that struggle, too, I think. Or this sort of, you know, further down he gets into the grace of fly fishing and all that. But this sort of God and fly fishing, which is supreme. Um, it, it just... I would have liked to have known how long it took him to write that. Or how many times he rewrote that paragraph. I don't know. Henry, is there any, has he ever commented on that? Did he ever comment on that? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, John McLean is a wonderful source for his some of his father's work, and there's been some scholarship. You know, it's a it's a story that he meditated on for decades. And so that's kind of, you know, what makes this a really unique literary work. I can't think of hardly anybody who at the age of 70 <laughs> started really writing fiction and then like knocked off almost a bestseller. I mean, it's really extraordinary in the history of literature. And um, so that might explain part of it, you know, Bill, that he was really, this was a story that he was thinking about and working on lines in his head for a long time. Um, but it'd be interesting to look at the actual drafts. I'm not certain of that. Yeah, because it's so kind of perfectly formed <clears throat> that he must have, I would, I would guess he labored over it, unless he got really lucky and it just, 
you know, he woke up and there it was, but I don't know. And as you say, the metaphor of, you know, religion and fly fishing is key to the book, but it's not a dogmatic, you know, uh, position either. It's not a, it's not an overly religious book in the sense we sometimes feel the weight of that, you know, a preachy book. It really, it's about, you know, form and grace too. Discipline to be sure, but, you know, kind of a salvation, you know, and, and the, the respect they have for the father, but they also tease him a little bit too, you know, his, his geologic dates about the age of rocks and stuff are, you know, quite a bit <laughs> shorter yeah. than real science. So the, the, the boys are kind of moving forward too generationally. They respect his father. Religion is important, but it's also a flexible kind of attitude. I think just about, you know, structure and rhythms and forms, and civilization, culture, really, you know. And not to get ahead of ourselves, but the, the last paragraph is like equally as powerful and great. It's, it's truly amazing. But um, I, I, I wondered if you think in his life there was a clear line between fishing and religion. Or do you think one is sort of elevated over the other? Did he remain religious? Not in any heavy way. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's more of a, I mean, religion as culture for Norman, you know, the father was a minister and very devout, but, you know, Norman was kind of more of a secular humanist. I think at one point he even refers himself as kind of an agnostic. Yeah. And it was such a structured household. Uh, the the oatmeal scene, and I have young kids, and that that made an impression on me. The, just his uh, young Paul not eating the oatmeal and right. how his father could not break him. Um, it was pretty funny. But well, you know, if you we, all of us know about fly fishing, and I think this notion that the world is chaotic right? That since Adam's fall, we sin all. This old Puritan idea that we are fallen people, and that how do we get back into God's grace? How do we put order? And fly fishing is the way to do that, you know? And I think, and even points out, like, if you, when you start fly fishing, you experience chaos, you know, and, and problems, you know, and the back cast in the bushes, you know, and there's even a scene in the movie, right, where young Paul puts his first cast right back in the bushes and Norman's kind of rolling his eyes. And so I think that that's the kind of religion that works in this, that, you know, through practice and grace and that we can achieve something more, you know, out of this wreck, this wrecked world. Do you think the river itself is symbolic in that struggle or, you know, maybe going from the, the, you know, work and, Paul's chaotic life and his debts and gambling and all these things. And then, you know, Norman is sort of trying to get a job or you know, raise a family. And then there's the river where you could just put all that stuff away. I think so. Rob, what do you think about this? You're a river man. Well, um, the thing about the river, um, I'm as intrigued by it. Um, a river, of course, is symbolic of many things that has been, whether it's mythological, literary, religious, or whatever. But it, a river runs through it. It's not a river runs through us or a river runs through you pick a million different things. Um, and going back to the first sentence, and he refers to a line. And of course, the line is pregnant because he's talking, I think, about the fly line, um, the lateral line on fish, the lines of music, the lines of prose. Mm -hmm. And that first sentence, I think, um, in a very sly, mischievous way, um, McLean is saying, this is not a book essentially about fly fishing. Fly fishing is in it. And of course, as, as fly anglers, we concentrate on that. But McLean is thinking about bigger fish. And I think he's using fly fishing um, as the line that links so many different things. And I think you touched on it, Henry, with the idea of grace 
um, and and religion, not in an institutional con, um, context, but in a spiritual context. Um, and uh, it, it, when you start parsing, a river runs through it. Um, one word leads to a sentence, a sentence leads to a paragraph, and they're all integrated in such a way, it, it's very difficult to isolate components in that novel because the river, whatever the river, it is running through everything from the, from the first word to the last word of that magnificent um, novella. It's very tight in that way, certainly. Very yeah, tight, built around the river. The river is always there. It's kind of that constant, whether the sound or the spray or the fish or the conversations beside it and or the river's own conversations with itself or back on itself, as they say at one point, which is a nice paragraph. Yeah, thanks for those comments. That was really brilliant. What is it then? What do you think it is that the river's <laughs> running through? I mean, we could probably talk about that for the next hour, but. Maybe the story. I don't know. <laughs> that one line in the book, he said, like, all the paths of life meet and a river runs through it. Like, when he said a river runs through it in the book, that hit really hard because <laughs> you're reading the whole book and then he kind of puts it together. Yeah, it keeps us all together. It's And there's all the sense. different parts of the river. And you, quote, read the river, right? To look at the holes and find the ruffles and all these things. And uh, it's yeah, it's a brilliant use of language. I, I, I first read. Uh, no, I, I first read the book. I guess almost fifty years ago, <clears throat> and uh, you know, it floored me. I didn't know that one could write that way or that way about fishing. And I remember thinking then, and having gone myself being one of many people who tried to get it made as a movie uh and it, and it wasn't until you know Robert Redford decided he would put his weight behind it it got made but i thought one of the problems of making it into a movie was one of the great strengths of the book which was he really did never fill in the trouble that paul is in uh when Paul is not on the scene, you're always worried that something is happening and something is happening. I mean, the guy finally gets killed. Right. But McLean never lays that out for you. So you're in the same state of anxiety, or I was, uh, that Norman was about his brother because he's not there. He's not pre When he's on the scene and he's fishing, you know what he's dealing with and he actually pretty much controls his world. But when he's not there, you're just worried that his world's falling apart. And I always thought that was a problem in trying to make a movie of it because I loved the tension of not being able to see what was happening and being worried about it. And I think that tension, like you say, is the is what carries you right from the opening couple of pages right to the last page. Uh, nicely, you know, the fact that they didn't fill in what really happened to Paul, that it's left the way they, they left it and how the father kept asking for more information there really was no more information to give and uh, it was just the police said this the police said that and that's what he had to live with and that i think that was he had difficulty obviously coming to terms with so little information um but that tension that started with the early foreshadowing right through stayed with the whole book you just knew something was going to get upended you know even the first time i read the book um and Norman struggles with that and talks often about wanting to help his brother, just like the women wanted to help that, you know, train wreck Neil, who <laughs> was fun to read about Neil being the um, cardigan wearing Hollywood living ex Montana <laughs> guy who shows up. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed that whole section though, because it's such the antithesis of everything they stand for. And, you know, I don't know if I could ever look at a coffee can the same <laughs> after all the imagery of the worms in the coffee can and stuff. Um, but it, I think Norman, obviously, you did say there's a lot of foreshadowing. And I think if you made the movie today, it would start with the murder, right? And then it would <laughs> kind of get back into all the other stuff. Um, but it's it's sad. 
that. Every time, every time you read it, I think you, you come away with something a little bit different, which is one of the reasons I think people go back and read it and reread it. Um, but certainly that eternal struggle that I think we have trying to reach, reach people who are difficult to reach and trying to help people, whether they're in their family or extended families or close friends who, you know, you want to you write by them, you want to help them. You can tell, you know, they're headed kind of down a, a path. You wouldn't rather not see him or her go down. And that stays, I think, through the whole book as well. They're always, you know, they're always worried about, about Paul. And they love him and they can't find a way to reach him. They never do really reach him that way. And that's, you know, I think wow. we've all probably had those experiences with people that you're trying to help. And that's a, you know, really puts you in kind of a hopeless position sometimes. Well, I think um, the marvelous thing about A River Runs Through It, though, is that Norman, by virtue of being an artist, by being a writer, he cannot understand Paul, nor can he help him. But through his writing, through the story that he fashions. And remember, Paul did Paul did die. He was murdered in Chicago. Um, so the death in the novel is fictionalized. But um, one of the purposes, I think, of fly fishing in the novel is that it's through fly fishing that Norman is able to redeem his brother. Um, his brother le lived a messy life, um, and he had many, many flaws. Um, but Norman was able, by transforming Paul into a everyman representative of the fly angler, um, he redeems Paul's death. And if you read the, the final pages of, of A River, um, very, very closely, Norman does something quite magnificent. He turns Paul into something beyond the, the actual person. He becomes a mythological type figure. If you look closely at the description of Paul, he is elevated. He The, the portrait it transcends ordinary everyday reality. And it's through Norman's writing, his through his artistry, that he somehow imbues his brother with something, atonement, salvation. Again, we use these religious terms and I'm thinking not so much formally, but rather almost mythologically. Um, he, remember Norman, he taught Shakespeare for 40 years <laughs> and he knew Shakespeare very, very well. And I think that, um, Norman applied some of his literary knowledge to creating in Paul a character where we have to, at, at the end of the day, think about Paul, not only in realistic terms, but in literary terms of a tragic figure, um, Hamlet, Lear, uh, much younger than <laughs> King Lear. But I think um, in order to really appreciate A River Runs Through It, I think we have to see it as literature first and, you know, look at its com um, components secondarily. If, if we read that novella, as a lot of my fly fishing buddies do, as a fly fishing story, you miss so much more of what I think Norman was trying to do and, it, and what he achieves with, with that. And so um, even though people are, are always asking, how did Paul die? How we need to know how he died. Norman is saying we will never know. And maybe that is not the right question to be asking how he died, why he died, what were the circumstances, but rather 
are there bigger questions that remain unanswered that Norman is really interested in? I think knowing how he would have, knowing how he died would have given the book kind of a, an ending that would have prevented a lot of people from going back and read it, reading it again and again and again, you know, leaving it unclear gives it a life beyond, you know, the years it's been published and it keeps it, I don't know, keeps it alive in a lot of ways, I think. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I was going to ask is why does he spend so much time describing and detailing fly fishing? And I think you just answered it because he turns it into this artistry and Paul's the master artist and to see him fish, you know, especially towards the end where Norman and his father are just kind of watching Paul fish in awe. Um, I, I think what you were saying just sort of answered that question for me. That was well said. Well, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't catch your name. Was it Rob? Uh, Rob, R-O-B, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, Rob. That was a great I'm, comment. I'm calling from uh, Waterloo, Canada. Oh, cool. I'm in Orlando, Florida, a little different. <laughs> Were you going to say something, Peter? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's a marvelous story. At, at the same time, I mean, it's a story about life. We all understand that. But he was able to tell the story through something he loved, which is fly fishing, uh, which I love, which I think probably all of us love. And so, I mean, I, I hadn't reread it in a long time. But, you know, and, and I always remembered the tragedy of it. But what really came home, home to me uh, now is how perfect, how one experiences the fishing the way he describes it. I absolutely know what he was, you know, I, I felt of, as if I had been there, if I underst understood the reasoning about stoneflies being six inches under, being washed down from a riffle. They're just wonderful snapshots that only if you fish do you truly understand them. But if you have something that you love, you understand this guy's writing about something he loves. So it's always been magic for me in that way. I've, I, I've actually never read Encounters with a Fish, and there are a number of them in the book, better or more full uh, than those. Yeah, without a doubt. It's, it's true. some gorgeous writing. Or beautiful, as the father would but say. Also I've got a question, Charlie. Yeah. For, for the group, maybe. You know, I was reading it this time, and, you know, Paul was certainly a natural, and he was supremely confident and, and gifted and physical and all of that. And the book makes it clear from the get-go that he, you know, he believes in betting on himself and getting himself out of any trouble he gets into. And... It's the more I read about Paul and the, the amazing last day, the kind of they had fishing together, and I wondered if, and the fact that his dad was a Presbyterian minister, was, you know, was his hubris at all part of his downfall or or not? I mean, he was kind of a mess as, was it Rob who put it so nicely? And, and he was, you know, he was phenomenal fisherman, very confident, same way in his life. I can do it. I don't need anybody's help. He he had a bit of hubris, right? And, you know, pride goes before the fall and some of those things. I'm, you know, I'm not a minister, but. Well, and he wouldn't accept help. So right. I think that falls in line with that. But I think that hubris helped him become such a good fisherman. He had so much self-confidence. And, you know, I love yeah, the part where they were talking about the general flies and the specialty mm -hmm. flies and how he only kept the flies in the brim in his hat and. Norman had a big old fly box with all kinds of stuff. And I thought that was all beautiful too. And said a lot about them as men, I thought. Mm -hmm. It struck me as a supremely competent person would just ask, I need three more years. Just give me three more years. <laughs> I don't think he needed three more years. I think he was, you know, he was a fully formed angler, you know, fully formed fly fisherman. He was, you know, he was a fly fisherman in full, but it's also our nature, I think, to, ask for another chance to ask for more time and I, and I wonder if that three years was that kind of request that something that we don't get it's not it's 
not going to necessarily be granted to us, especially maybe if we've always been someone who never asked for help. I don't know. I might be reading way too much into it. No, I, I think even that line, give me three more years, it might have been as the author is, you know, to saying like he wanted three more years with his brother, too. I don't know. Well, the question also is, why does someone, it's, it's an unusual thought to have, why Why do you ask for that amount of time, which isn't really big when measured against the lifespan, unless you sense, you know, that things are going south or could go south. I mean, I think Paul knew the tightrope he was walking or occasionally had enough self-awareness to know that. And I think folks who really like to gamble always kind of have like a big score in their mind that they <laughs> somehow they think they could pull off, you know? So maybe it had something to do with that too. But um, there was something I, and maybe going back to the whole fishing versus religion thing, but the use of the continental divide in the book, you know, obviously that section of the mountains where the water either flows east or west. And there are several times where they go over the divide to go fishing. Um, so I found it really interesting as some sort of symbolic thing is, you know, crossing into a different place or um, do you think this divide that separates maybe those troubles Paul was facing in the real world again, or do you think that had any significance at all? Kind of jumped out at me. It did wow. kind of seem like he was stepping into a different world um, when he would go to the river, but it wasn't like he was forgetting his whole world. He was still remembering it, but it was, he was able to completely focus on the fishing. And, he, and more at peace. In that. Kind of like that, like escape, but then, you know, things come creeping back in like retrospect because he's telling a story from the past, from the future. Yeah. And how do you feel the women were portrayed in this story? Do you think it was a fair portrayal of the women or do you think they were just sort of a marginal part of the whole story? Because I read that Norman had five sisters and this story is only about two brothers. So I'm curious. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if Norman did have five sisters. There in Wikipedia, I think it's Wikipedia. Wikipedia says something right. to that effect. That that was in my uh, half-ass internet research. Yeah, um, I I I doubt that. Um, not because of the degree to which a river runs through it is autobiographical, but John did not refer to that in in his book. Um, I think it was just one newspaper report on on a very small newspaper in Montana um, that made that um, um, observation, which found its way into Wikipedia. But um, I'm, I'm very, very uh, um, leery or skeptical of, of that. So it just doesn't make any sense. And, and the, the women in um, the novel, um, Norman is playing with a lot of stereotypes and a lot of traditions and a lot of myths, including um, the myth of the West, the Wild West, the Pioneer West. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, with Peter that used the word love. And um, how do you kind of um, balance the notion of love in a novel set in the West where men will be men and sheep are sheep and you know that old saying. Um, I think Norman is playing with the whole idea of the Western mythos here. And I think that through fly fishing, and I think you really hit on something important, Peter, is that is the way that it's the vocabulary of fly fishing that enables Norman to talk about love. And I find it interesting. He did not turn to traditional religion. He did not turn to the Bible to express the love that he had for his brother. Um, but in fly fishing, because he loved fly fishing, he shared that love with his brother and his uh, father. Um, and he shares that love with us. And I think 
in no small part, um, the, the reason why people continue to read A River Runs Through It, and I've read it about seven times fr from the time um, shortly after it was released to now when I'm over 70, and every time I read it, I'm reading a different book. There's things that I find more important than I did the last time I read it 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I, I'm, I'm much more tuned into it, it being a novel about love and about beauty as, as much as it is about fly fishing. And in, in dealing with these two rich, deep themes or motifs or ideas, he has found fly fishing as the vehicle to explore these two very, very deep um, ideas. If, uh, you know, Charlie, I really loved your question. Gabriella, coming back to that original question, could you respond to? Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing that really sat with me at the end of the book, because I read a lot of fishing literature now, when I was younger, it was harder for me to read because everything is set in that he, and you have to get past that. You know, you have to recognize the time. You have to recognize that hopefully writers will change now, but it's the past and you have to recognize the time. But one thing that really sat with me after I finished the book was that he mentioned in, I don't know, the beginning, middle, um, a husband and wife out fishing and she they didn't make waders for women so it was you know tight on her but she he described that in detail and didn't really say anything else about it other than it was an observation and that that put me in the book so you know anyway like the other women are just typical women for the time but the fact that that reference was in there I would reread it you know it 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 just it made me like the author a lot, you know, for putting that reference in there. Um, so yeah, and other than that, I just feel like it was uh, well portrayed for the time. And then I felt like when he said, because there was one line that said, um, when he brought the prostitute fishing, uh, we knew, you know, he knew we didn't want her here. She shouldn't be here. I didn't get the impression that she shouldn't be there because she was a woman. I got the impression that she shouldn't be there because she was a prostitute. So that was my take on it. That's interesting. Um, I'm really glad that you weighed in on that because, you know, the book has gotten some criticism from feminist you know, critics uh, regarding, as you pointed out, Gabriella, and you, Rob, you know, there is the Western the the large kind of archetypal figures of the prostitute and the angel i mean jesse is just so lovely and wonderful and rawhide is is you know right you know maybe affectionately portrayed but at one point you know i think it's norman or paul wants to kick her in the ass you know i mean and they do yeah <laughs> they do. I mean, and so uh and then you have mona Sita, right mabel the the native american who's also kind of hyper romanticized you know maybe her ancestors were at the little bighorn and, and you know mutilated some soldiers and so you know it's again but i think you're right gabriel for the time period and for you know norman's uh generation it's it's okay you know it, it works well enough but i like that scene that you pointed out that's really it's over an overlooked scene yeah it struck me that it really is very much of its time I, as you know charlie i've been putting this book together and trying to and, and succeeding, getting a lot of women, uh, like, you know, fly fishers in it. Um, the, you know, it's like reading. It's it's like reading Huckleberry Finn. How much slack do you cut it? You're going to cut it a lot. Um, uh, yet at the same time, you know, I felt women were very one dimensional. Just put in the piece to move it along or allow a page turn uh and similarly and i'm not faulting him for for not being alive now and writing it but i'm saying you look at a book that was written then by a very enlightened person and you see how the women are treated and also the way indigenous people are sort of as you say you know stereotyped um it's, it's not a reason not to read the book it's not a reason not to love the book but when you read it now, with the hindsight of 50 years since it came out, 
uh, those things become apparent. Yeah, that's a great point. And the Scottish women seem very tough, though. Like these men seem a little fearful of them, <laughs> which I really loved. And it was, I think, Paul and his mom had a really unique relationship. It seemed like he could really make her laugh. And he always was the one who leaned back when he hugged her, which you know, I think moms adore their youngest kid. And that part of it I liked, but I agree with everything you guys are saying too. And I liked how Paul fought for um, his girlfriend and all that. Um, so the lack of communication between Paul and, or I'm sorry, um, the main character and his wife, Norman. Norman it's, okay. That is his name in the book. I wasn't sure um, between Norman and his wife um was just that set the time for me because I'm like you know as time progressed I think communication in especially in American culture anyway and they're in America but they're practicing Scottish culture it's at the time and the culture for me very well yeah I felt a little sympathy for Clara the, the mother my mother uh, as a devout Catholic she had three sons and she grew up with fishing poles, crab nets, basketballs, baseballs, hockey sticks, hockey pucks, They're all focused. that stuff. She always wanted, I think she wanted a girl, but you know, she got three sports oriented brothers and, a, and my father was athletic and he stayed athletic into his eighties. So she was wonderful. She had that kind of patience that you need because otherwise everything around you is, like I said, it's not a hockey puck, it's a basketball or something. It was, uh, must have been difficult. Oh, yeah. I wonder if she fished. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. Um, it didn't seem like it. Uh, <laughs> I don't think she did. I don't know. She was running church socials. Right. <laughs> right. They're talking about the mother in the book, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because the scene with the metronome where she would go and get her metronome because she didn't want it outside. <laughs> well, that's, that's a cool scene, awesome. too, the whole rhythm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's contributed to the rhythm. So in character development, do you think Norman inserts himself as a character really in the story, or do you think he's more of just the narrator? Oh, I, I, when, he, when he writes a fishing scene and puts you in it, He's a character, but you, you, the reader, are that character too. I mean, he's really very effective at that, I think. And I think there is development. I mean, it's really very essayistic too, in the most lyric kind of beautiful way. And there are moments, you know, later in the novella where Norman is reflective about this being a story. Do you remember that? Where he's like, you know, I suddenly realized that these things, life becomes a story, you know? And so the 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 artistry, the self-reflection is there. So it's a very subtle kind of character development. And coming back to what Peter said earlier, you know, there's actually not a lot of plot in this book. And, you know, when Redford got it, he was like, McGuane, the story goes, McGuane gave it to Redford. And Redford's like, you know, I love it, but I'm not sure I can do much with this, you know. And that's why, if you notice in the film, all that voiceover, because it's a very voicey book. It's a strong very personalized first person narrative and you know like the things that we talked about early about a lot of unsaid stuff but that's where the development comes in more like a personal memoir would or you know an essay than in the traditional you know kind of you know plot driven novel it's not a plot driven novel really yeah i is there any segments or sections anyone would like to read because some of it is so beautiful i i outlined a bunch of stuff i don't have a copy of the book um right now but the scene if anyone has it like bookmarked or anything where he compares the fish to like a submarine and that whole fight scene was absolutely incredible to me that was my favorite part of the book yes it, it was something before it was a submarine it was a boat right or a it was like a boat and then a submarine yeah yeah, it was it, it, it was a, maybe it was a plane. I don't I don't remember exactly. Um, but the way he was able to uh, intertwine um, the, what was going on with the rest of his life with the fishing narrative um, is something I think my 
English teacher has been trying to get me to figure out how to do for a long time. And this was a really good example <laughs> of that. Well, and there was a few passages, you know, in Angler's Journal, because we, we write about all types of fishing, not just fly fishing. Um, and I think, you know, personally, I try to be at least decent at everything, not really a perfectionist, but there was one segment in here that it really reminded me of the magazine. Um, it's sort of halfway through the book. And he said, he's talking about his brother and he says, even though Paul must have had three or four fish by now, I took my time walking down the trail, trying with each step to leave the world behind. Something within fishermen tries to make fishing into a world perfect and apart. I don't know what it is or where, because sometimes it is in my arms and sometimes in my throat and sometimes nowhere in particular, except somewhere deep. And I just was like, oh my gosh, she's talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> there was another part I really liked. Um, and I think you alluded to it earlier, Gabriella, when you're talking about the whole rocks and time and all that. Um, it was toward the end. Um, Norman's father is reading a Bible and says that he used to think that water came first, but quote, if you listen carefully, you will hear that the words are underneath the water. And Norman says, this is because he is a preacher first and a fisherman second, but his father disagrees and says that Paul will tell him the same thing. The water runs over the words. Oh yeah, that was great. That was great. That was really great. Yeah. What you know, it's like, well, what is he trying to say about Paul? I mean, there, that's a lot to unpack in that little bit. A literary aside, because Charlie got me thinking there early on about him being uh, over 70, and he writes this great short thing. And uh, one of my favorite novels and movies is The Leopard, Giuseppe de Lampedusa. And he was 66 years old when he wrote his first piece of fiction. Uh, so maybe there's something about not trying to write an 800 page book, but waiting until you have a hundred great pages in you uh, <laughs> to get it out there. It's, it's harder to write short, I think. What, what would you say to that, Bill? You know, typically writing tight is, you know, writing tight is, is difficult. Um, you know, this book didn't, this book didn't feel like it needed anything else. You know, it felt like it was just right. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, the best columns are give you just what you need. And sometimes if you're working on a, on a limit, you know, the piece comes out a little better because of it, because you can leave out the extraneous material. So I like to write tight and I thought the writing was tight all the way through. Oh my and god! And the plot, yeah. as as uh, Andrew was mentioning, yeah, the, the you know you have the tension that something's going to happen, and then I think I don't know who said that people keep asking, you know, we should know what happened, we should know what happened, but really it was the, the tension that kept you moving through it. You knew something was going to happen, and really why it happened and the details after the fact really weren't important to the story, as important as some, some people think. Um, it was just you know. A brother who was helpless to to help him and a, and a father likewise couldn't quite reach this, you know, gifted, beautiful son of his, you know. Yeah, and I even think they say they the family like never really spoke about it again, which I find pretty crazy, because if something like that were to happen in my family, I think we would talk. That's about the it. I think that's <laughs> the time too. people used to, you know, people used to be. You know, people used to be, I don't want to say they were tougher, but they were just used to taking more hardship and there weren't a lot of safety nets that the government provided or any provider provided. So you, you know, you, you suffered your losses and you buried the dead and you kind of went on. Um, there wasn't... That was a very Scottish thing as well. Um, my background is Scottish and uh, um, you, you just my grandparents and my aunts and uncles they they were not kind of emotionally extroverted um and uh it, it, if you look at the portrayal of norman's father 
he is very, very tight. He's a tightly wound man. And um, um, another thing that you, you, you said earlier about um, the, the breadth or the brevity of the novel and the tension, um, I often will read um, Ernest Hemingway's uh, um, Big Two-Hearted River before yeah. I read A River Runs Through It Again, because um, if, if there is one seed um, that helped plant A River Runs Through It, I think it's Hemingway's book, or I'm sorry, his, his great short story. And the, Hemingway, of course, had that idea about the most successful writing follows what he referred to as an iceberg theory, where um, so much of the backstory or the context for the story that the writer knows is submerged. It's not what the reader sees, um, but in reading um, a work of literature, the reader somehow can intuit or feel these darker currents, even if they're not explicit in the, the narrative. And I think if River Runs Through It kind of follows the same literary um, blueprint because, you know, what we've talked about tonight, there's so much that we're kind of just barely touching touching on. it, it And there's just so much more. And I think um, that's, you know, when you're talking about the tension, um, I think we feel it because we know there's a lot more that is in that novel than in the, you know, 110 pages that, that we read. I, Rob, I think that is such a perceptive comment. And I think we those two works really should be looked at together. In fact, it's a centennial uh, of Big Two-Hearted River, 1925. John McLean is bringing out a new edition. He wrote a foreword for it that's really wonderful. And you're so right. It's what's not said that makes both of these works so effective. They're very, very different. But, and then coming back to what, you know, Peter, you were saying, but the detail of the fishing, you know, the totally authentic, totally lived details ritualize, you know, this these acts. And for Nick and Big Two Hearted, it's very solitary. There are no other features. He remembers people, but before River runs through it, it's family, it's relationships are very important. So they're different, but I think they kind of fill in a lot of what angling, American angling literature is all about. It's laconic till it gets overblown. Yeah, no, it's a, those are all great points. Um, what a, I would like to talk a little bit though about that whole segment with, um, Rawhide and the brother. What was the brother's name? Neil? Oh, the brother-in-law? The brother-in-law that Norman got stuck with and Paul and all that. Um, as a as a bait fisherman, <laughs> it feels like, you know, to these guys, it's like the biggest insult to call someone a, a bait fisherman. And I just enjoyed that whole segment so much. It kind of gave a little light lightness to the book. I'm curious. Um, if you feel it played a bigger role in the overall story or what? It's comic relief. It's comic relief. And, you know, all writers are storytellers. Norman's a great storyteller, but Neil, Neil's a liar. Neil's a pathological liar. And, you know, so he, he takes it to that other level that it's fun to laugh at, but it, it's not real. It's a different kind of storytelling. And, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's ridiculous. But it's, it's a lovely foil, you know, to the whole notion of telling stories, I think. Um, well, I love him in the film. It, I mean, it's just one of the great things about that movie. It offers the absolute necessary humor there. And I, too, I'm a big bait fisherman. Um, and so, you know, the purists, you know, have their have their day with Neil when he gets all sunburned and hung over. I love this sweater when he got off the train, didn't he? Have yeah. <laughs> In the book, he had two sweaters on. <laughs> yeah. A turtleneck sweater and then that, um, what did they yeah. call it? The Davis Cup sweater. Um, but it, it's just, it's funny. I think there was so many stereotypes 
in Neil of of what you know that blow hard guy at the end of the bar who's talking about himself and um it was just fun to see how they ignored him and how he just kind of was his own demise <laughs> it's just hilarious that was, that was well it's interesting i mean it's a very shakespeare shakespearean trope you know to put in the i mean there it's a very rosencrantz and gildenstern kind of scene I mean, it, you, you could take it out of the, the novel uh, or the novella and everything still moves forward at the same pace and towards the same conclusion. But there it is. And it allows you to take a breath and it's funny and fun and ridiculous. So yeah, it I, just I, makes the book better. Yeah, because <laughs> it's funny. How you laugh out loud like the book has everything then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. You could remove it and, it, you know, it could go on. But, but red asses, you'll always remember red asses. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, so how do you think, do you think this book and the subsequent movie have, I mean, obviously they exploded the popular or the popularity of fly fishing, but how do you think, what do you think the role is in the bigger world of fly fishing that this story has, has had? Because like we said, I mean, it, it's really not a fly fishing story like we're talking about it, but. It sure, you know, I saw some numbers about the popularity of fly fishing. At, the movie came out in 1992, and according to my half-ass internet research, in 1988, Montana averaged 2 million tourists a year. The movie came out in 92, um, and the fly fishing industry saw a 60% increase in 92, and then another 60 in 93. And by 2005, 10 million people were visiting Montana. So it grew fivefold. So, I mean, I don't think that's all the book, but curious what you guys think. Bad for the fishing. <laughs> Bad for the trout, but. <laughs> yeah. A lot of use for good for orbit, the stage, and all those guys. You do a lot of used fly rods for sale after the first three or four years of that surge. Mm. But, you know, I was watching the movie and my 10 year old came home from school and it was like half over. And so he sat down and watched it with me. And he normally does not last through a movie unless it's about, you know, some superhero or something. And he really liked it. And he, I was shocked. He sat there and watched the whole thing with me. And just and then afterwards, he was like, because he's seen me fly fish, but he has never taken any interest. And now he wants to go fly fishing. I can see the I didn't realize like um how good the book was until I read it but I had heard a lot about it like on podcasts I don't I don't exactly remember what podcast I was listening to but there was a guide from Montana who was saying we basically have two uh eras in the history of fly fishing pre a river runs through it and post a river runs through it because when you came back that next season they had like triple the guides triple the anglers and i'm sure it died down from there but they just said like <clears throat> after the movie came out it was like brad pitt and everybody wanted to fly fish oh yeah so and, and then reading the book and i watched the movie like last year or something um i wasn't extremely blown away by the movie but the book obviously I'm, I'm blown away yeah the descriptions of the fishing in the book are some of the best ever um and i think the movie's great at just showcasing the river and you know a big river like that especially in the movie when they go down the river in the rowboat or dory or whatever that was and you see the power of it um it's beautiful stuff you know i used to live in colorado it's it is inspiring just to be there but part of me is like oh there is it too much but i feel like fly fishing is kind of in a popular boom right now too it seems more and more people are getting into it so maybe it's just cyclical i have no idea but yeah, I, I know um john mcclain has spoke about this and it's 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 interesting that it definitely brought a lot of anglers to Montana and the impacts were pretty hard at first. They were negative in terms of catching too much fish and trampling, you know, streams and all that. But then, you know, the kind of consensus is that ultimately it was very good. 
that it raised consciousness about conservation. It led to, you know, kind of pushing back on mining and logging, which were coming hard, you know, still. And so, um, like many things, at first, you know, you don't want too many people fishing, and fly fishermen certainly don't want too many people on the river with them. But a lot of people care about fly fishing and places like Montana, Colorado, maybe in a way they, they wouldn't have exactly. So I think ultimately it was a positive thing. That's a great point. And it's so true. If you lo love fishing and you love being on the water, you're going to become a conservationist. And and that's, we need that more now than ever. So, and there's always, well, and you live in Oregon and there's always land use issues and natural resource issues and all those things. Everyone's a stakeholder. So I think that's a great point. Um, I mean, there's one, I think, interesting thing about a river runs through it, um, because it's kind of representative of what has happened to the writing about fly fishing that has taken place since maybe the 1970s. Um, it, it's often thought that the turn of from the 19th to the 20th century was the so-called golden age in American fly fishing. Um, you certainly in, in uh, New England, uh, the Catskills, the Adirondacks, the great fly rod makers, um, the real makers, people like um, Gordon um, and uh, the whole Cat Catskill school of, of writers. But um, a river runs through a kind of is a threshold novel for what I believe is the golden age of fly fishing writing. And we're in it right now. Um, I read a lot of fly fishing literature. And when people talk to me about, oh, I've never read a, a better book about fly fishing than a river runs through it. And I say, for example, have you ever heard of Ted Leeson or the great Harry Middleton? Um, Harry Middleton's books, particularly The Earth is Enough, is in every way as good a book as The River Runs Through It. And Harry Middleton writes as well about fly fishing as does Norman McLean. And I just kind of compare these two writers because um, there isn't a year that goes by that there's maybe a dozen fly fishing books or books that have fly fishing in it that tend to be about other things, whether they're autobiographical, memoir, whether they're short stories or works of fiction. And the writing about fly fishing now, I don't think has ever been better. And I think as a river runs through, it has um, inspired people to get out on rivers and actually fly fish. I think that more than any single book, a river runs through it has inspired writers. And in that way, it's a little bit like a, a modern complete angler. Um, if you recall, um, Norman mentions the com complete angler early on in a river. And of course, Paul has something, you know, scornful to say about Isaac Walton. But if you read a complete angler, it's amazing to what extent that 15th century or book kind of echoes throughout a river runs through it. Like even the idea of fly fishing being a balance between the contemplative <clears throat> life and the active life. You've got in a river, you've got Norman, the contemplative, and you've got his brother, Paul, um, the action hero. And um, even the, the really interesting idea in a river runs through it, of shadow casting. And of course, there's been some debate, you know, and Norman McLean, um, John McLean kind of uh, talks about it in, in his memoir on his father about 
is there really shadow casting? Did Paul do it? Is there such a thing? You know, wouldn't that just scare fish? And, you know, there's a debate around that. But it as, as funny as it seems, in The Complete Angler, Walton talks about something that, you know, it takes a little bit of um, yeah. imagination, but he's talking about something in The Complete Angler that's is very similar to what Paul or Norman is talking about in A River Runs Through It about shadow casting. It, it's so uh, the, 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 I guess the point I'm making in a very long rambling way is that A River Runs Through It has been just as influential in the literary, in, in the literature of fly fishing has it, as it has been in the, uh, the practice of fly fishing, which I think is quite extraordinary. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I like that whole, we were talking about the active and the contemplative. That's really, it's really interesting. Um, shadow casting though, we already, I don't think it works. <laughs> when, that, is, when is 92 in the shade written? In the 70s, oh. right? Like yes. 72, would you say 72? Something like, yeah. Like, because I was thinking, you know, I got the, uh, you know, McLean's book is completely from an elegiac era of fly fishing writing about trout fishing. Uh, and it's very lyrical and, you know, Mozartian. And at the same time, you have the beginning of something that we've seen grow and grow since the 70s, which is sort of, you know, rock and roll, you know, uh, recreational chemical uh, saltwater fly fishing. Uh, and that's that's a whole body of literature that really didn't exist uh, uh, when Norman McLean wrote his book. Um, so things have changed and, move, and moved. But it really was, if you wanted to write about fly fishing then, uh, you wrote about trout fishing. And it's always seemed to me to be a great loss in American angling literature uh, that as much equal amount of ten uh, attention wasn't paid to uh, bass fishing with a fly rod, which uh, one can do in much more of the landmass of the United States. But uh, it was fly fishing from Walt uh, for trout from Walton, and it stayed that way until the last 50 years or so. Point. Quickly induced. Is that what <laughs> That was funny the way you said it. Oh, I that. forgot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm sure I'm sure McGuain and, and all of his um peers were were highly influenced by this work and, and the ones you know, we're always sort of walking in the footsteps of those before us and it's um it's cool to see and it, it is just a great genre. I did want to mention and I'm gonna put a link in the chat here of a article that Henry, who's on the call with us, just had published in the American Fly Fisher. Um, and he takes a really deep dive into the three different versions of this book and the artwork and the cover and how that, all, that whole process took place. It was a, a really interesting read. You did an awesome job on it, Henry. And I think everyone would really enjoy it. You wanna talk a little bit about that, Henry? Just sort of the art used, the, the sketches or the, the engravings are really cool. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, no, it, it's right. interesting that the book inspired so much artwork. And so I just look at the three major illustrated editions, the first edition uh, and this, and which has these, these kind of, um, you know, scratch port images uh, that are very basic, but imitate kind of wood engraving. And then there was a photo edition, Joel Snyder, who was Norman's, uh, Son-in-law was a professor of art at the University of Chicago. He did photographs of the big Blackfoot. And then the great addition, I thought you have that, Charlie, is um, Barry Mosier's brilliant illustrated edition with wood engravings, right? And, and so that, and that image right there is kind of one of the main points in my article that the book through the illustrators became increasingly nonfiction. Even though Norman says it's a book of fiction and it is sort of, people were so eager to dig into the real life. And so 
like the fact that there's an illustration of the author in you know inside the book suggests that people really want to embrace the real story as we often do we want things to be true and so that line is murky uh in the story as well as it should be but a lot of people and and even beyond the illustrated there's a lot of art out there that has just been inspired by this book you know just adding to what we've been talking about today it's 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 really turned on a lot of people it, it truly has and it is artistry everything about it i mean We've all felt it when when you're casting just right and you're standing in the water and things are moving. It's just zen. It's it's beautiful, and it's almost. Of course, you want to catch fish and you're trying to catch fish, but at the moment, it doesn't really matter. And it seems like when you get to that level of inter uh, thought and everything is when all of a sudden you get a bump because <laughs> you're not overly focused on it. But yeah, these these engravings in here are really neat. I'm trying to find a, he did some really beautiful flies and they were influenced by the gentleman you mentioned before, Henry, um, who was, uh, what was it? It's George Cronenberg's. Cronenberg. Who was, right, right. Who was younger than, than Reverend McLean, but was taught by McLean to tie flies. And so George tied flies for the McLeans, as did Norman Means, who made the famous Bunyan bug. But this Cronenberg's character was fantastic. And, you know, these flies are very regional too. They're, they're quirky, weird flies. And in fact, there are illustrations in that edition of flies that aren't even mentioned in the book. So again, here again, the story of the McLean family and their fly tying, fly fishing history, in some ways kind of takes on a life of its own, you know, but, uh, yeah, Mosher is a brilliant illustrator, and he, you know, he wrote back and forth to Norman, and he got some of the flies, and so it really that that itself is a really cool story. Yeah, it, I I enjoyed your article a lot. I I think everyone on the call will as well. Um, but I, I think we touched on a lot of stuff. Is there anything anyone wants to bring up that we stepped over? I want to hear somebody kind of analyze the. Last couple of paragraphs, we'll get some opinions on it. You want me to read them to start? Sure. Um, all right. Well, where should I start? Because this whole section is really good. They're talking about questions that can be answered or a lifetime you of could, questions. You could start with, of course, now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman, maybe. Of course, now I'm too old to be much of a fisherman. I'm trying to sound like Robert Redford. <laughs> and now, of course, I usually fish the big waters alone, although some friends think I shouldn't, like many fly fishermen in western Montana, where the summer days are almost Arctic in length. I often do not start fishing until the cool of the evening. Then in the Arctic half light of the canyon, all existence fades to a being with my soul and memories and the sounds of the big Blackfoot River and a four count rhythm and the hope that a fish will rise. Eventually all things merge into one and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. So good. <laughs> Why can't I do that? Why can't I? <laughs> Just to make one comment, I, I mean, thank you, read that beautifully. It really, it seems to me about both an apotheosis, as you were alluding to earlier, Rob, that this is a highly spiritual, gorgeous moment of truth and beauty and annihilation. I mean, time washes us away and it's nothing anyway, right? And there's all kinds of ge allusions to kind of the geologic time. And this is a, this is an elegy. This is a, a, a love poem. I think that was actually Norman's words to his brother. And he's gone. And no matter you know, how beautiful you make the story, and I'm so glad he did, it's also, you know, it all fades away anyway. So, I mean, it's, it's a prose poem of the highest order. Beautiful. And he's he's coming to terms with it or accepting it or it's like that final stage, you know, and especially I guess he's coming to terms with his own life and his own fragility. And 
he can't fish the way he used to. Um, and we see that in the father figure too, with the fishing and he can't quite fish. It's just so beautiful. When he says some of the words are there, is he probably, is he talking about the people he knew in his life? Or who came before him? That's a good question. What do you think? I don't know. I thought maybe then the others, I didn't know. Well, I mean, some of the words are there is, I don't know what the other words would be with it. I don't think it would be scripture, but some of the words are there as whether that would be his father, his brother. Could, this might sound silly. Could it be the fish <laughs> <laughs> or, or the bugs or the, the environment? Or, you know, there's, he talks all about that geological stuff over and over. And I don't think that the father was right saying the rocks were a billion years old or what have you, or uh, the great flood and all that. But there's, Every time Norman describes a river, it talks about, you know, how the river began during the glacier and the ice age and all this stuff. So I guess yeah. under the I mean, rocks. The antecedent the of that sentence is rocks. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I mean, grammatically, it's the rocks, it's the rocks which to me means, you know, like, that which is, you know, the, the mass of all existence. Um, but it's, it's you cryptic. Know, Henry, you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> yet, <laughs> and yet, um, we think of rock as being permanent in some way. But more permanent than rock is water. There was water before there was rock. There will be water after rock. It is the, the, in nature, what we know to be nature, and that might include chemistry and physics as well as biology, water is the alpha and the, um, the other one, al alpha and omega or whatever, the, the beginning, the end. And it does flow at, through everything. We are water. We are our, our very existence water. Um, took place in water. And when when there is no more planet as we know it, um, there will be water. There is water before everything. There is water after everything. And the river will run uh, through it. Yes, exactly. Now, what what that is that is a statement, but it's just loaded, loaded with symbolism, meaning, associations. It just as you think of Paul when you think he says he's haunted, you know. So it works on both levels of whether he's thinking yes. of you know his father, his brother. And still haunted by that, or he's thinking, you know, the, the bigger, the bigger sense that we're only here temporarily, and the waters will continue to run, and the rocks will still be here. So poetic, and the and ecclesiastical, the 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 rhythms of the language, even though it doesn't refer to any passage in the Bible, um, and I think the other thing too is. Um, I think Norman was really influenced by the oral tradition of literature. And in, 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 in paying close attention to the rhythms of Norman's writing, um, there is a, a, a really good storyteller, somebody in the Celtic tradition um, who, you know, would get you around a campfire or um, at the hearth in the middle of winter, telling a story over and over again, the repetitions, the, the variations within certain languages and, and certain passages. All of this, I think, Norman is bringing to bear on his writing. And uh, the, the, a lot of the really... Um, 
po what we would call poetic or lyrical passages in a river runs through it. You can all, you can cast a fly rod as you're reading it. And going back to what I said earlier about the line, so that there is nothing accidental. There is not a word out of place. There is not a random word in a river runs through it, even the punctuation. And when you're reading it, think of a, a fly rod in your hand. And so many passages have that rhythm of a fly rod. It's, it's, it's brilliant. Well said. Really well said. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed this. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Thanks for this is the first time we've done this. So thank you for bearing with us and, and joining in. And um, what book should we read next? Is 92 in the shade or Harry Middleton's The Earth is Enough? I wrote I that down. I'm gonna check that out. It it will you you will laugh out loud and you will cry like a baby. It it's it's such a beautiful beautiful novel. Is, is that the one where he gets fired? No, th that's that's uh, his his last book um, uh, published posthumously. This is when he is a, a young teenager and he oh. goes and lives with his uh, grandfather and great uncle in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. Mm. It's it's a magnificent, beautiful, beautiful novel. Okay, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll put some titles up on, or with Gabriella's help, on social media, and we could have people vote and see what we. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, but I hope to see you all again soon. It was nice to meet you, Rob and Peter and Henry. Good to see you and Gabriella, Bill. Thank you so much. Um, cool. Yeah. That was fun. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was nice. Okay, okay. Good night, America. Nice meeting you for the first time, Henry. <laughs> nice meeting you, Rob. Thank you. Good night, America. Good night. And good night, Canada. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good seeing everybody. Bye bye.